Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for this for this evening for the third um, discussion in our Border Literature series. Um, my name is Breed O'Sullivan and I work in the Learning and Probing section of the National Library of Ireland, uh, just behind me, the building behind you, me, for any, anyone who's not familiar with it. Uh, this is a discussion series on literary perspectives and borders and it is framed within our Decade of Commemorations programme. The series looks at how writers have shaped their ideas of borders from individual perspectives and how it's represented in the literature. The Border Literature series curated by Professor Nicholas Allen and the National Library of Ireland in association with the Wilson Centre for the Humanities and the Arts at the University of Georgia. This evening's book uh, for discussion is Death and Nightingales by Eugene McCabe. We would ask you actually to put any questions you have in the Q&A and my colleague Ruth will be um, looking after the chat function this evening. Our moderator this evening is no stranger to the National Library, um, Martina Devlin. Martina has written 11 books, including novels Sisterland and The House Where It Happened. Her latest book, Edith, a novel on Edith Somerville, will be published early next year. Awards Martina has achieved include the Royal Society of Literature V.S. Pritchard Prize and a Hennessy Literary Award. She writes a weekly current affairs column in the Irish Independent newspaper and has been nominated, has been named National Newspaper of Ireland Commentator of the Year. Martina was the first uh, person to get the PhD in literary practice from Trinity College Dublin and she presents the podcast City of Books for the Dublin UNESCO City of Literature and the Museum of Literature Ireland. So I will hand you over now to Martina, who will introduce our panel for this evening, and I hope you all enjoy the event. Thanks. Over to you, Martina. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Breed. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Let me introduce you to our panel. Owen McNamee was born in Kilkeel, County Down, and has written 17 novels, including Resurrection Man, The Ultras, The Blue Trilogy, and The Vogue. He also writes for cinema, radio, and television. Owen is director of the Oscar Wilde Centre in Trinity College, Dublin, which makes him Professor Owen McNamee. Dr. Owen Flannery lectures in the Department of English Language and Literature at Mary Immaculate College, University of Limerick. He's published more than 60 scholarly articles and book chapters, and is the author of five books, including Form, Effect, and Debt in Post-Celtic Tiger Fiction, due out next year. He's currently working on essays on 21st century Irish poetry. So we have a wealth of Owens here tonight. And although you may have spotted that my name's not Owen, I am a Tyroan woman. Three's a charm, as they say. We're going to start by discussing this wonderful book. It's Eugene McCabe's classic novel, Death and Nightingales, such an evocative title. And it's about love, betrayal and retribution set in the 1880s in Fermanagh. So let me start with you, Owen Flannery. When was Death and Nightingales exactly written and what, what's it about? Well, it was published in, uh, in 1992. Um, and really, as you said, it's, it's set, uh, I suppose, in the midst of the, the Irish land war towards the end of the, the, the 19th century. Uh, it's set in Fermanagh in May 1883. And the, the present day, so to speak, of the novel is set on the birthday, the 23rd birthday of Elizabeth Winters. Uh, who's the female protagonist um, and crucially she is the, the 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 kind of illegitimate to use that terminology daughter of um of her of her mother uh, who's deceased who predeceased her and she lives with her stepfather billy winters and one of the cruxes of the novel is this uh the fact that uh, elizabeth's mother was uh, pregnant uh, when she married billy winters and she knew this so the novel centers on as you said this idea of love and betrayed love uh, but at the core as well, as, as, as the title of the series, of this series indicates, all sorts of boundaries and borders are transgressed. Uh, we have tension between Billy's faith and his family and, 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 and the ownership of land and the disinherited Catholic uh, stepdaughter, Elizabeth Winters. And there's a, there's a real tension there uh, that really you know, builds up over the course of the novel to murderous violence and potential murderous violence as well. So it really is a, 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 a kind of thriller, a gothic thr a thriller, uh, a black pastoral, a black romantic novel uh, that's, that's utterly gripping to the very end. Mm. 
Oh, and McNamee, you were there at the genesis of Death and Nightingales. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was doing a thing called the, the, the National Writers Workshop, which is a very kind of grandiose title, but Eugene was, was running it. Um, he'd been asked to run it, and I was there, Pat McCabe, Philip Sinjin, people like that. Um, but Eugene said, OK, you're all writing something, so I better write something as well. And he started bringing in the first chapters of, of, of Death and Nightingales, um, which he, he, he refer, always referred to as Gothic pastoral, but he always did it with a bit of a grin on his face, so I'm never quite sure what to... Um, but the actual genesis of it from him was uh, the book is dedicated to JC, who was his gardener in this big house he lived in, Dramard, up on the border. And JC told him the story that it actually happened, that this, this plot had been overheard in, in, in the shrubbery in one of the big houses up there. Um, so so that, that's, it's, as much of what Eugene did, there, there was an element of, of, of truth and, and fact in it. Right. I love that idea of gothic pastoral. I mean, it's a wonderful subgenre. I mean, I was. What else could fit into that? Wuthering Heights, maybe, or yeah, exactly, yeah. But yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, it it has that feel. I mean, it, it has that. Although Eugene's perhaps more of a controlled writer, if you like. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of control there, but it has that elemental feel to it that, that, that Wuthering Heights does. So I mean, it's, yeah. and you know, it's, it's, it, you know, I suppose it's no coincidence that the Brontes came from not that far away from where Eugene was writing it. You know, and, and yeah. the, the, yeah. other, the other end of the border, but um, yeah, mm. but then. Um, one of the things that struck me about it, because I, I knew Eugene over the years, was that um, in terms of the actual, if you like, the political background and, and the feel for that land and politics, if you like, was that Eugene's father was the founder of Celtic Football Club. And when the house, when Eugene lived in, in a big house, a kind of small manor house, if you like, in, on, on the border, uh, just, I mean, a couple of fields from the border. Um, and his father was invited or instructed by the bishop to come home from Glasgow and, you know, very successful man and buy this farm and the land um, as part of the, I suppose, kind of a, 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 as a political um, act, if you like, um, to, to establish Catholicism in, in the area. And, and, and it was a, an act of reclamation, was it? Well, you could say it's an act of reclamation. You could say it's, it's, a, it's an act of recolonization. Of, you, know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the secularity of it, if you like. I mean, and it's, it's a theme which runs through the book. I mean, Protestant and Catholic runs through the book and, and land and, 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 and ownership, if you like. And, and, you know, it kind of strikes me as, I mean, I'm from the border, but I'm from the, the, the east uh, end of the, of the border. And I come from what was described as Bible Belt and I'm quite, quite bitter place. But again, to use that word again, there's an elemental thing about the divisions between Protestants and Catholics, almost in a sense, it feels as if it predates Christianity. And it's particularly highlighted at the border. Well, I, I, I don't know what it is actually, is it, is it the border or is that border land? Is it that sort of, you know, kind of uh, Fermanagh, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of that particular area, there seems to be something kind of very Deep set and deep, a deep seatedness and, and visceral uh, thing to it, which which is um, you, is expressed in blood. I think in, in mm. blood and vengeance. It, it's quite a sort of Greek feel to it. And it's pre-Christian. It it has that feel to it. It has that feel that it, that it predates. Well, certainly can pre pre Reformation, if you like. I mean, that in the end, that the, the religion, if you like, um, hides some deeper um, psychic schism that, that, that's there. I mean, there is there is that that I think that's in the book, isn't there? That that phrase that blood will tell. I think it's used at some point in the book, um, and I, you know it, it does come out of the, the, that whole idea that Owen is talking about there in in the novel. This sense and and beyond in in, in McCabe's other work, the sense of mutual pathologi pathologization that that they're that they're they're subsisting on pathologizing the other. Um, that there's a there's almost as if there's a a, a, a kind of reference point. A negative reference point for the other side all of the time, uh, and that there's a kind of overdetermined relationship between the two, based partly on religion, but maybe as Owen said, and I haven't thought about that myself. That goes something much, much deeper uh, beyond that, that. Those kind of Christian, uh, Christian points of difference, um, and it, it, it's interesting actually that uh, you know when you you talk about the. the the blood will tell and, and the difference one of the most interesting sections in the book i think is, is that chapter 10 at the concert with percy french where there's a certain sense of decorum a certain sense of 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 of, of kind of ecumenical sobriety in the room but actually 
by the way Eugene focalizes that section, we get hints of the differences of the tensions, even in this kind of ostensibly uh, civilized space. Mm, mm. Yeah, and then there's you know <clears throat> when you look at the idea of sort of blood as well, blood and, as in bloodlines and and yeah. uh, transgression, if you like. I mean, um, uh, Beth Winter's mother is pregnant by another man, which he marries Billy Winters, but he doesn't know that, and then she gets pregnant by. Um, uh, <clears throat> by, by somebody, you know, and that's sort of, you know, if you like, sort of, is, is part of what, what um, triggers the events in, in, in the book. But there's also the, uh, there's a deep transgression where, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's beautifully expressed, but quite chilling when she says, because Billy approaches his, his own daughter in, in, in bed at night, and uh, mm -hmm. she says afterwards, when you kissed me, not fatherly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's quite chilling, but, but it's, it's that, Blood and transgression. I mean, it, it, yeah. the idea of incest is even more transgressive, if you like. Mm. It is, and and it's it's interesting. You mentioned to say the it's um isn't it, it it's the terrorist um Liam Ward who 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 Beck, Beth becomes pregnant by, and it's interesting that, that that when Martina mentioned Wuthering Heights, um that there is an echo there that again that I hadn't you know, I hadn't picked up on the, between Heathcliff and Lee and Liam Ward, um even in the the physical description. Of Liam Ward when he enters the farmyard and Beth sees him and, and the first she says that the first time she saw him, he's described in these kind of beastly terms, but it's something again that 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 she finds irresistible. Yeah. Um, that it's is it, and, and and there's a sense of transgression there as well. That it's 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 not this human beauty that she finds alluring and attractive and irresistible. It's a beastliness that she finds uh, unable to uh, un unable to overcome. Um, and that, you know, and, and if we think about, you know, the logic or the plot arc of the novel, it, it, what does that beastly transgressive attraction make her do potentially or is, is leading her to do? Uh, but it was an interesting parallel. I didn't I, didn't, I hadn't thought of that, that 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 link with with Heathcliff and um, uh, and Liam Ward, uh, you know, and, and you're and you're right there on that that idea of of the bloodlines. Um, you know, Billy says that, you know, that this this uh, miscegenation the cup of Rome, you know, he, he, when he, he goes off on one of these, uh, you know, paroxysms about, uh, probably usually drunken as well, of course, uh, about his, her mother and, and, and her, um, that it, it is about this, this polluted pathology, this polluted bloodline uh, that, you know, and, and, and as, as, as you said, that that goes beyond, you know, it, it's informed by religion, but it, it, it's more elemental than that, isn't it? The, the, the reference to the, the body and reproduction. And yeah, then there's but... something else with the elemental uh, um, part of the novel, the plot, the idea of the bull goring the um, the mother. And this this bull has got mythic resonance, you know, the, the Tawn Bull Cooligan. And of course, it's the border area, you know, the cattle raid and, and the, the war over a bull. It, it just seems to link it to Celtic mythology. Yeah, well, in actual fact as well, I mean, Eugene bred prize bulls. And, um, he knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about, but he knew what he was talking about in, in terms of animals and husbandry and, and, and all that. And in actual fact, I mean, you know, I mean, Eugene's uh, language and uh, kind of dialogue is exquisite. Um, if dark, darkly exquisite, I suppose. Kind of, um, but I remember he did tell me that he was, he was at a seal yard and King of the Castle on the Abbey and was doing very, very well. Uh, so he was in the papers quite a bit, and uh, a sort of older neighbour approached him and said, um, "I suppose you do be snaking round ditches, listening to people." And he said, "You didn't quite like Patricia." He was a little bit offended by this. He, and then he went away and said, "Well, yes, that's more or less what I was doing. He was, he, he was picking up the language from seal yards and things like that." It's his job as a writer, isn't it, to be snaking mm. around the place, eavesdropping on language? And I mean, he has the dialogue absolutely pat, yeah. um, like. I could hear it when things like using the word Tara, he's a Tara, you know, or a terror, but it's it's something you only hear in, in the North. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, sorry, go ahead, on. No, no, go ahead there, you. No, it just saying the ear is, is, is incredibly well attuned and, and, and to, to, to language. And uh, I mean, what, what struck me about the book rereading it for, for this was how well written it is, how incredibly well written it is. I did start to wonder something about it um, in the way that Eugene was recognised, or perhaps not recognised. I mean, he would say himself that he was a he was a kind of sporadic writer. He wouldn't write for long periods. But, you know, he had a politics, and um, I do wonder if it worked against him um, 
I mean, on Bloody Sunday, uh, uh, after Bloody Sunday, Eugene went into the Diamond and Clonus and read the proclamation, you know, kind of, he had, you know, he, he had an unflinching, un unwavering gaze on it. Um, when I think as time went on, you were expected to waver, you know. What know. happened in Clonus when you read the proclamation? I don't know. I don't know. It was Pat McCain told me that this, but I, I don't know what. Uh, I, I presume they didn't kind of, you know, burn the diamond down or wherever. <laughs> It, it was extraordinary. The house where you could, he was looking, I read somewhere that he was looking right into an army post, a listening post, and they were looking right back at him. Yeah, they could look in through the, um, I think it was with the window and the stairs, they, 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 they could see in because we were just across the border. And the bridge, of course, which had been the, the main thoroughfare, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. had been cratered, had been blown up by the army. And uh, so, the, if you like that, that, that whole hinterland was cut off, which is, of course, what happened to Clonus as well. It, it, it got cut off from its, from its actual hinterland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting oh, when you make that point there about, um, uh, you know, about whether, you know, say Eugene's reputation and, and, and the novel and, and whether it got as much attention. I mean, it's, it's often I've thought of that myself about you know, the politics of the novel and his own politics and, and the timing of the novel. Um, and when you look at, like, you know, you look at someone like McGahern. Um, whose work is obviously beautiful and well-crafted and aesthetic. And he's always looked at in that kind of aesthetic way. Um, nobody over-politicizes or over-theorizes McGahern's work. And it's almost for years, you couldn't do that. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, an equivalent aesthetic achievement in something like Death in Nightingales, maybe, maybe even a superior aesthetic achievement, um, gets less critical attention because its, its thematics are maybe deemed, and for want of a better word, incendiary. Um, and, and it loses out because of that, because of the timing, because of the politics. And, and it's, it's kind of aesthetic achievement is, is relegated in relation to some of maybe his contemporaries. I don't know, I mean, it's an impression I get sometimes. Well, the incest <coughs> element is, or the suggestion of it is really very powerful. I mean, perhaps mm. it shocked at the time. I don't know, I don't think, I don't think so. I, 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 I think, you know, Owen is on to something there. I mean, I think uh, Eugene's uh, politics and his unapologetic politics. I mean, he, you know, he was a peaceful man. You know, he wasn't an advocate of, of anything in, in particular. But he, I suppose, he insisted that um, the, the, the people who were involved in and, and whatever many sides were along the border were, were depicted in the humanity um, and, and in, in all the humanity and, and were um, ciphers, if you like, um, yeah. political ciphers. And, and I, I, I do wonder if that worked against him. Okay. Okay. And I think the the the, the human. I mean, you're 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 absolutely accurate there on that idea of the humanity. That what I often found about, say, Eugene's work was that 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 honesty of 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 portrayal of human weakness, human frailty, um, betrayal, all those things. And I think one of the reasons that they're so important is because what he's doing is, as I said, showing all these different sides from a human perspective. Because because what's he up against? He's up against abstractions. Um, he's up against political abstractions that drive people to do things. And how do you dignify the people that suffer at those hands? Will you portray them as, as human beings? Um, it's as old as the novel, that kind of thing, you know, the post-colonial novel. It's, it, you know, the, the more complex human portrait is more dignified than the, 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 the kind of abstraction that is making you suffer or is oppressing you. So I think there's, that's one of the achievements of, of this novel and obviously the short stories and, and, and the other fictions as well. And of course, the historical context of Death and Nightingales coincides with the land war, as you mentioned, Owen, earlier. What's the significance of that in terms of border fictions? Well, I think, you know, if you, if you think about the, the, the period in which it's, which it's set, um, the first thing is obviously that, that, that he, Eugene invokes one of the kind of, you know, a, a huge figure in Irish politics, but also, you know, he's well aware a major figure in, in, in Irish literature around the period as well, you know, a figure that, that is there in, in Joyce's Dubliners and there in, in, in Yeats's poetry. There's a clear echo there. But but I think, you know, when, when we think when we think about the various land acts that are happening, you know, in 1881, for example, and the campaigns for, you know, fixity of tenure, free sale, fair rent, what you kind of see there, and, and he's clearly aware of this, is it is a change in the terms of engagement between the landed and the and and the and the tenantry. Um, you kind of the legislative undergirding of, of imperialism isn't being sundered really, but it's being chipped away at. Now it doesn't it isn't completed for another you know maybe half generation or more. Um, but I think the, the idea in the background that the, the kind of mood music in the background there to to Billy Winter's family situation, the micro situation is this macro situation of the land war, 
um, you know, the political, and, and I suppose it, it, it's happening all over Europe at the time when you, you know, the, the emancipation of the serfs in, in Russia is happening at the same time. What's happening is, is, a, is, a, is a kind of elevation of expectations. And once you raise expectations, any politician knows, like we know uh, with our uh, impending lockdown, uh, once you raise people's expectations, it's almost impossible to put a genie back in the bottle. And I think that that, that that's part of the macro environment and atmosphere of, of death and nightingales, really. Right. There's also, the, you know, in, in, in the way it's expressed as well, in, in, uh, before um, Beth Muller is, is killed by, gored by the bull, and there's this uh, beautifully written uh, row between the two, between uh, the mother and Billy Winters, and she said, I'm a Maguire, and the Maguire's <laughs> won this yeah, yeah. hundreds of years before the winters everywhere. Yeah. 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 And I have my, yeah. uh, it's almost Shakespearean, she says, I have my name. You know, you may have, yeah. you may own the house and the lab, but I have my name. And you get echoes of that with Liam Ward as well, don't you? The idea that we were here beforehand as well. Mm, mm. It's just the idea of waiting in the long grass, waiting, you know, our day will come. I don't I can't remember the fact that what, on where, where, where the, the hunt tries to cross an elderly man's land and he comes out and he tres, threatens him with a gun. Um, again, one of, one of the yeah. dangers. I can't remember the story. In, that's in that's actually Dini Mahan in Victims, isn't it? It's in okay. um, yeah, yeah, from is, Cancer. Yeah. He's in, he comes out in Victims in the River. Yeah, um, yeah. But just if you go back to Liam Ward, I mean, he's implicated in the in the Phoenix Park murders um, in wasn't that May eighteen eighty two? Uh, again, so that, that even there, it's threaded into the into the central narrative. The private familial romantic narrative is is kind of braided into the kind of national national struggle, if you will. Um, and of course, not just the national struggle, um, uh, uh, you know, an acutely violent and shocking murder in, in, in the Phoenix Park uh, the, previous, the previous year. And I think actually it was, it was the May the previous year, so it was almost a full calendar year later. There's a kind of symmetry or balance to that even. And then the, the, the man from Dublin Castle comes down to, 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 and meets Billy Winters and because Billy won't mm -hmm. cooperate with him, he tells him that Beth is pregnant by, by, by Liam Ward. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, you know, it's, that, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a kind of colonial thing in, in the sense it's done in the most civilized of, of ways for, for what the same yeah. most virtuous of, of motos, but in fact, it's, it's more visceral than taking pitchforks mm -hmm. to someone. <laughs> and actually, that scene uh, with um, the guy from, from Dublin Castle again, it, 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 it reminds me of that of, of, of Eugene's dramatic roots as well. Um, you could imagine that scene being filmed in a in a, pr a police procedural or something like that. That the, the policeman with the excess knowledge is is stalking Billy Winters. Uh, Billy Winters, you know, they, they both assume they have the upper hand, um, and it's it's played out beautifully in, in that kind of dramatic, you know, the office at the quarry um, and the dialogue and the the suggestion and the hint and the threat. It's really kind of you know, and you, and you can, it's really I suppose it's built up to a climax. And you mentioned there on there the climax, which is. The, the ultimate revelation that will really kind of destroy uh, at that point anyway Billy Winters obviously kind of does a kind of redemption towards the end but that, that really you know he holds the ace card and it's beautifully played by the Dublin Castle operative but it's beautifully dialogued and drawn out in the in the story itself. Yeah. And speaking of the kind of gentlemanly way of sticking the knife in as Owen McNamee mentioned there's a scene with the solicitor who's advising Billy Winters against leaving his possessions to Beth. He says, if you go first, she could marry one of her own. And then he makes a reference to, did we go through 300 years for that to happen? And it's kind of quite shocking, one of her own. I mean, she was reared by Billy Winters as his daughter and yet the idea that her religion makes her different. Her... Well, I grew up in, in Kilkeelan County Down and was referred to as, as offensively enough as, as a colour bar and the Protestants would not sell land to a Catholic and if, if, if there was nobody who wanted to take the land the money would be found to, to, to buy the land and it, it, it persists to this day um, it, it operates the other way of course as well but because of the, there was a preponderance of money on one side you know, it, it, it was more affordable but um, so that land thing that sort of um, you know uh, somebody talked about the, the, the fields and John B. Keane and, and, and in the context of that. But there's a folksy kind of thing which kind of to, 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 to the field um, in, in a way which which kind of lets the, the, lets the reader off the hook in a way, lets, it, lets the, the eye rest somewhere else. But uh, in this, there's, 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 there's no respite, you know, the, the, no. 
um, it, it, it goes right to the, to the very fundamentals of, 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 of men and women and land and blood. Yeah. And it, isn't it, it works both ways, though, doesn't Isn't the canon, at one point, he has out the, the farms of Fermanagh and he has that, that, that book or that, that, that document that outlines you know, the Maguires and, and the winters and all that. So there's a, there's a kind of mutual awareness of, of injury, of possession, uh, of, of, of escheatment, all these different things. They're all documented down. Uh, and as, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's almost like a, a keeping a tally of, of who took what from when and, and, and when and, and where. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, as, you, as you mentioned earlier on about Liam Ward, and you know, waiting in the long grass, and it, our turn will come around again. Um, but also, when you talk about the the, the idea of of ownership, um, that there's a there's a there's a real kind of contingency to it all as well, um, because Billy Winters has all this documentation, but he doesn't realise how close he is to being poisoned and having that land taken off him without even knowing about it. Mm. The same way that Beth as well, she doesn't realise how close she comes to having all this fortune taken from her. And while they're all those two movements, they're all part of a kind of thriller plot. There's also a sense in which Eugene is pointing to the, the contingency of all ownership and all fortune, that there's danger working you know, around the corner. There's betrayal in the closest corners of your of your domestic setting or of your community. Yeah, I mean, there is a sense of, of, of a war in the book, isn't there? I mean, it's mm -hmm. slow moving, but, uh, but it's in, inexorable. It's an interesting you, know, you, you, keep, you, you refer to the, the filmic nature of the book. And I think, I mean, Eugene started off writing for television and, and uh, it was always very approving of me whenever I was doing any television work. So I'm, I'm glad to have you doing some commercial work. <laughs> you know, but, but it was very important to him. You know, he said, he said you know, you don't, your, your family shouldn't suffer for your art. You know, so I mean, yeah. um, you know, so he bulls and he said, raspberry fields put his children through college. I remember? <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I'm casting my mind back. I mean, he, he I think he wrote this with um, television in mind, and there, there are quite a lot of us for set pieces, and you can see the, the television writer's eye working there. And he uh, he persisted. He didn't get it made for it must have been the best part of thirty years, but he persisted. Yeah. And the last time I saw him was at, at, in the, the uh, hotel beside the BBC in Oval Avenue in Belfast, and uh, I realised after there he was up signing the you know the, the, doing the deal um it was screened on rt and bbc2 in 2018 in a three-part series yeah yeah just while i have you there owen mcnamee does the novel still speak to the present you know although it's set in the past i'm thinking yeah. of the ethnic cleansing of the border for example yeah, we must refer to as ethnic cleansing in Fermanagh. Um, but, he, he, you know, and, and there is that, as I said before, that, that elemental bitterness there, which is not explicable in, in simply in terms of, of religion or, or, or politics. It, it runs much deeper. Uh, and it's still there. Of course it is. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, good, good, good writing is always relevant. Um, uh, you know, it's not a it's set in history, but it's not an historical novel. There's it doesn't nothing, feel historical. Nothing dusty, it feels dusty, very it, present. It, it mm. feels like a 21st century novel. Um, and uh, I mean, the, 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 the themes are, are universal as well. I mean, if, even if you, you know, if you don't, if you remove it from its own particular historical context, I mean, it is, it is about lust and vengeance and men and women and, and land and blood and uh, miscegenation, as, as the one said, I mean, you could take it and you could set it in the, in the deep south. You could take it. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a hundred places around the world you could set it. And yeah. You would recognize the themes of it. And there are all I mean, kinds if, of lusts, aren't there? I mean, even even recently, I mean, you, you know, there were, there were there were a couple of um, a couple of murders and violent incidents nowhere near the border. Uh, one in Cork, North Cork recently, uh, where uh, we had a murder suicide pack over a farmland mm. uh, within the family. You know, these these things. You, know, you could say that we can talk about them in relation to the border and various other borders, but actually, the, the idea of land and we, you know, you can you can privilege Ireland and say that, you know, because of our colonial history, once possession of land is in a family, they're very loath to leave it. And and you know, we've all heard anecdotal evidence if we live near the country or in the country of an unwillingness to to uh, to let a family intermarry for various reasons about, about land. Uh, you know, brothers, uh, family members falling out over land. It's, it, it crops up all, in, in different ways, of course, um, away from the specific context of the border. Anna Vernon said something to me as well once, um, 
it was done with a, a novel previous to to milkman and she said uh, a lot of the critics said at the time that it was using family as an analogy for the troubles and she said no it was the other way around um, <laughs> you know uh, but uh, you know in, in, in a sense like, you know, in, in eugene's book it's almost like the, the you could you could say in, in a lot of work that the if you like the political backdrop is used as an analogy for family if you like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. kind of a greek type uh, <laughs> Greek myth type family, mind you, you know, it's, yeah. uh, you wouldn't like to have Christmas dinner at their house, would you? Um, no, no. On Flannery, um, you've, you've talked about Gothic literature being a particularly useful vehicle um, in other work. You talked about it to showcase the traumatic, the other. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent does this novel um, fit in with these historic Gothic narratives? I think you know we've touched on some of it. I think you know if we, if we talk about the land war, mm -hmm. um, but also the 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 primacy of land. I think we've just touched on it there. Um, the 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 anxiety, and I think there is that there with Billy Winters. I mean, one of the things that fuels the kind of uh, you know uh, Anglo-Irish, maybe Protestant imagination in, in Gothic terms, is a kind of residual guilt and anxiety over the way the land was secured. Um, you know, we think about why. Why, why are there so many castles in Ireland? Uh, what was the function of the big houses? They weren't just showing, showing off wealth. There's a, there's a real insecurity uh, uh, baked into the walls of big houses um, and of castles. And, 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 and even though Billy's house isn't a big house in the sense of, of, of some of them, um, there's still, a, there's still that, that, that anxiety that he returns to and that he betrays um, over, his, over his, his, his daughter. And as you mentioned, Martina, in relation to the conversation with the solicitor, um, in showing her the documents that established the Winters, uh, you know, genealogy in this beyond beyond Ireland and, and once it returned to Ireland. Um, and then the concentration on reproduction as well. I think that's one of the key things, because, you know, how do you keep a colony going? You have to make children um, at, so that the politics of, of, of reproduction are, are important. Um, to colonialism, to, to, to Gothic literature, these anxieties about ownership and proprietorship. And they're, they're very readily evident, of course, here. Uh, and, in, and in some of the short stories as well, and in, in Tales from the Poor House, the idea of sexuality, female sexuality and its role in society are brought up again and again. And, and that idea is, is a thread through Gothic literature as well. Well, but it's the untrustworthiness of the female, isn't it? Because yeah. the, the male needs to know that it is his line. And yeah. of course, it wasn't Billy Winter's line, you know, as you said, yeah. uh, his wife was pregnant already. Mm. Well, yeah. well there, you know, I, I'm just kind of thinking of the, 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 the darkness of the imagination in it when Billy Winters approaches his daughter in bed at night, drunk, that in some way he is it, 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 it even unarticulated to himself that he yeah. wants an heir to, to, yeah. to, to, to this place. Yeah. Uh, and and, and that's, I, what, that's what he's doing, you know. And the phrase you quoted, Owen, about not fatherly, I mean, the, the way it's just, it's, it's almost like a, not quite throwaway, but there's a gentleness, but also a real vivid violence to the undertone of that phrase as well. Like, it's just the skill that Eugene had to, to phrase it like that. And the implication of it completely outweighs the kind of lightness of touch that he, that he exhibits there, I think. Yeah. Uh, Owen Flannery, Death and Nightingales, of course, is a pre-partition narrative. Mm. Does that change the dynamic? I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think there's a there's enough concentration on um, on boundaries as we've been discussing, on 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 on, on division, um, and, and and really, I suppose you know, as a historical novel written in the in the eighties and published in the nineties, um, it's isn't it giving us a bit of the prehistory of partition itself? Um, you know, it's it's giving us a bit of the backstory. Um, it, it's dramatizing it as one said at, at, a, at a kind of local or or familiar level. But but the roots of the roots of partition maybe are there. The the, the references to Parnell, the references to to um, the legal enshrinement of these of these of these um, of the estates, but also of course the chipping away at them through the various you know land acts from 1881 and into uh, the Ashburn Land Act that started the 20th century and onward from there that create a sense of of expectation but also anxiety depending on which which side of the the border maybe or which side of, of the religious border you're on mm -hmm. and Owen McNamee borders are with us even now and borders within borders for example the peace walls um I mean 
do you have a view on borders? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, borders, you could argue, are, are an authoritarian act, if you like, uh, and it, it rears its head um, from Trump's wall to Viktor Orban's razor wire to the wall that we in Europe have constructed against the East, if you like, against refugees, to the rabbit proof fences in, 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 in Australia. I mean, the, the, the offensing uh, Gaza, you know, it's, it's the, the colonial act of, of, of fencing, the colonial act of, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we tend to articulate borders in the sense of um, the politics which create them and maintain them and not think of them as being a, an actual, an act in themselves, a political, a willful political act in, in, in themselves, the, the, the drawing of border, that it is, it, it is inherently violent, mm. the drawing of a border, mm. I think. Mm. Do you think the same, Owen, or do you? Do you I'd, agree. I, I, I'd agree. I mean, we, you know, in certain corners, you can you can get drawn into ideas about you know uh, the positive mediating spaces of borders, and that's that's a discourse as well. But I, I do think in, in this in this particular context that there's a, you know, we we have to pay attention and be reminded to the fact that it is a, it's it, it's not a locally constructed border; it's a locally felt border, but it's part of a broader political macro structure. It's part of a political economic economic system. Um, that that has agendas and that it's it's there, there are, and it's it's not an abstract, it's it has material consequences every day for people and it, you know it, as as I once said it's a it's a politically willed act. Mm -hmm. One of, one of the, the analogies I could have found for it was um, Willie Pat Cunningham who who uh, was the, the pilot of Greencastle. He pilot uh, the, the container ships in or the freighters into into Warren Point, and uh, when he died, my mother I remember my mother saying very quietly that he smuggled the material for my wedding dress across Carringford Lock because that's a border as well, of course. Mm. And the image of her wedding dress hung in a cupboard for years, untended, with thousands of hand sewn sequins on it, and just this, this quiet and uh, quite sort of beautiful melancholy analogy of a of, of, of border and and, and division. Mm. 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 Um. So are there resonances of these issues in other Celtic fictions? I mean, how does Welsh or Scottish fiction deal with its borders? Um, I think, you know, uh, if we consider the style of writing um, and, and, and the kind of landscape, uh, you know, someone, I would say someone like Niall Griffiths, for example, um, who, who lives, I think he lives in Liverpool, maybe he was born in Liverpool, has a Welsh heritage. Um, He's very much preoccupied, particularly in 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 a in a kind of a, a kind of a humorously tight novel like like about Welsh identity called Sheepshagger. Um, but it's, you know the, the, the kind of throwaway title actually conceals a real violence uh, and tension uh, within Welsh uh, within well, a corner of Welsh culture towards towards England. Um, and it's not something that we you know we we sometimes are drawn to you know to to the, the kind of maybe the glamour of of, of Irvine Welsh and. The, the, and, and maybe the, the less glamorous side of, of, of James Kelman. But I think it's the, the, the Welsh writers like Griffiths are very, 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 very interesting in that respect. I think something like Sheepshagger as well draws on this kind of dark, dark romanticism and dark romantic, romantic aesthetic, um, trying to tease out the, the, the kind of divisions between Welsh and English identity in terms of class, in terms of language. Um, and 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 you know the, it's not the same as uh, it's the same as Eugene McCabe in, in many ways it's different historical context, but style of writing the the, the, the dynamism of the writing, as I said the, the the way in which it seems to draw on on on, on gothic on, on on dark romantic aesthetics to tease out this this um, this kind of cross communal relationship is it has echoes I'm not collapsing them into each other but there are certain analogies there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I worked on a on a Welsh TV show called Hinterland was. Uh, Joints for Welsh language and English language, um, uh, and it was—I it, mean, it really was a hinterland with the hinterland of Aberystwyth and, and the mountains, and but it was about the dispossessed. And I thought it interesting in in, in Welsh, its name was—I mean, forgive my pronunciation—Eguil, the dusk. It was the, the dusk of a people, if you like. And I remember having a conversation with the the, the filmmakers who were all native Welsh speakers, and, and you know, carried that very lightly. Um, and they said, "But you have a culture." And I said, but you, you, you know, Ireland has a culture. And I said, but you have the language. The language is the culture. And I said, no, it's not. I, I, I didn't really have an answer for it. Yeah, said, yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. Um, I'm just, um, I see we've got lots of questions coming through. So we'll, uh, I'm going to move to some of them now. Uh, Adeline Henry says she's impressed by McCabe's ability to give voice with great humanity and 
apparent understanding to characters on both sides of the divide. She asks, um, do either of you have any comments on how he achieved a feeling of truth, particularly in the Protestant slash unionist voice? And she's thinking of his heritage story. Anyone want to come in there? Yeah, so well, yeah, um, um, yes, but I mean, we're, we're, we're back to that kind of un unflinching eye. I mean, he, he, he wrote it as he saw it. Um, and, uh, you know, I always think with, with Eugene that the uh, it, it doesn't mean that the, the sort of decency and civility and 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 courage are absent from either Catholic or Protestant, if, if you like, but they're hard won. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, those those virtues are, are are very hard won. So yes, I mean, of, of of course, I mean, Eugene was nothing if not fair-minded and and uh, unprejudiced. So yes, yeah, so, so he, he he wrote what he saw, you know, under a certain element of. Um, a story was told about a uh, um, John Hume remonstrated with uh, a, a, a decent man in in, in unionist in in, in council in Derry who, who just voted against housing for bog siders, if you like for Catholics. And I said my, my 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 hand was high as I put up his hand to vote, but my head was ha was hanging. Um, so I mean, there's a very Eugene type story about the Eugene perception of, of the strains that these, if you like, that the politics put on people. Mm. And the fact that they, in most cases, they succumb, succumb to the strains because, because that's the kind of society that they live in. It doesn't eradicate their decency from it. No, and it, it does. It, I mean, I think the phrase used there on is, is, is very prescient for heritage. If you look at the dynamic of the family in that story, that you have the uncle, George Hawthorne, who is portrayed as this kind of man, uh, almost maniacal uh, 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 figure. Um, and then you have his sister, the mother of Eric Hawthorne, who again is 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 very uh very sober form of of of, of protestant religion um and then it's it, we can talk about the son but if the father is cotton and the father's an interesting character there because he has that that sense of, of trying to opt out of trying to be decent of trying to be fair um but he's he, he's essentially i think almost a functioning alcoholic who goes missing but he's trying to retain under the strain of this intimate um extremism i suppose is what you'd call it He's trying to struggle to, to maintain some kind of honesty, some kind of truth and some kind of dignity in the midst of all this. And I think that's Eric kind of he partly inherits that as well, doesn't he? That sense yeah. of what should I do? What should I do? You know, there's, there's a there's a there's a kind of um, uh, there's a splinter of, of decency there you know, in him. And he's trying to struggle with it without being, as you said about that counselor, without being disloyal, without reneging entirely. Uh, I think he works that out in heritage with the father and that son and the way they're caught in the crossfire of the mother and the uncle. So we have a, a question from Stephen Hopkins. Is it significant that Death and Nightingales is a full-length novel rather than the shorter form that Eugene McCabe tended to use? Um, and he uh, also asks, is, is it a pity that some of the other stories were not treated in the longer form? Well, I, I mean, I suppose for, for any writer, you know, the, the, what, what you're trying to tell dictates its own form. Sure. Uh, so I mean, this this this, this story demanded, if you like, Death and Nightingales, a, um, a novel length. I mean, I I think, you know, there are points of contact between writing short stories and film, for instance. I think the, they're both in in many ways, film and television and and theatre, they're unforgiving. You know, the the words words out of place can can throw a story, can throw a a, a screenplay. There's a very, uh, and I, I think Eugene was, was, was adept at that. He was adept at, at working in those tight corners, if you like. But as I say, I mean, what do you want to tell dictates this manner of telling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, if you look at, um, if you look at the, 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 the Christ in the Fields collection, you know, Victims is, <laughs> it might be a short fiction, but it's, it's, it's a very long short fiction. Um, and, and heritage is a substantial story as well, you know, longer than I think most short stories. So cancer really is, is the most, uh, I suppose, mainstream uh, short fiction. Um, and if you know, if you look at victims, it 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 you know, is, you know it's a novella, isn't it really? And um, to, as you as you said, Owen, it's 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 the content that often dictates the form, the story you're trying to tell, um, and that that story. Where we're we're trying to get to again, as you said, like television, like drama. It's you know, we, we we've got a very confined uh, cast of characters there for most of the story. Um, again, it has that dramatic feel, 
Um, but we're trying to get different perspectives. And again, like you said, the generosity that, that Eugene has in his writing, um, he's, he's showing us these different perspectives. Um, and, you know, and at the end, you know, the last word in, in Christ and Fields and in, in, in Victims is the word beautiful. So he's, he's, he's kind of, he's giving us all these different perspectives, but he's actually maybe pointing to something in the future as well beyond uh, that, the immediate tension of that particular, um, of that particular set of events. Uh I wonder, have either of you considered perhaps how other writers use border fiction, um, not just in the Irish context, maybe someone like um, Cormac McCarthy, who uses borders, you know, political borders, but also psychological and imaginative borders? Well, I suppose even something like McCarthy fits that, um, that, that, that scenario I, I talked about earlier, where, where the um, you know, the, the border is the, is the analogy for people, if you like. You know, um, you know he's, he, he, McCarthy is, is, a, is a political writer. You know, he's, he's very aware of, of the politics of, of dispossession, if you like, I mean, how he treats the Native Americans. Uh, and uh, like Eugene is, is a very, um, is, is an eye is very alert to landscape, but it's also very alert to blood as well and to, and to mm-hmm if you like, the ghosts of, of, of the past. I mean, the, the, um, and also, you know, kind of alert to the misery and degrad- degrad- degradation that exists in, in American borders. And, and, and that they, they drew the exactly same kind of malice to them that our own border did. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think McCarthy, I mean, McCarthy is very interesting in this, in, like you said, in the sense that, you know, he's, He's kind of a, you know, when we, th- when we think about the, 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 the historical context in which he's writing, you know, the, the idea of the American West had congealed into this kind of mythology. Um, and McCarthy's writing, you know, is, is kind of in a way debunking that, this idea, this myth of American exceptionalism. Uh, and I think you're right about the border. The border is there, but the border mediates other forms of borders as well between America and what, go, you know, and, and Mexico, Native Americans and, and, and the settlers. Um, and you know, and and you know, is is replete, like you said, is 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 replete with blood, uh, with terror, with opportunism, um, and it's you know, it, it it in a sense, it's responding to its own set of uh, its own set of mythologies that have elided, um, you know, victims of history, the exploited, the the dispossessed, um, and and of course, to be truthful to that, you know, you 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 have it uh, soaked in blood, whether it's McCarthy's Border Trilogy or something as Barack as, as Blood Meridian. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, I mean, the border in a way is a meridian. You could, you could, you could yeah. lift that word and, and, and fit it into Eugene's work as well. You know, and yeah. it, it, it would sit there quite, quite easily. Mm. Was, was place very important to him? Obviously the whole border area, but was it specifically Clonus on McNamee? Well, was specifically for Lard, yes, absolutely. The place, place and people. Um, just when we were talking there, it came back to me a, a, a story. I mean, his father was placed there. He was put there for, for political reasons, if you like. Um, and there's a kind of sort of slightly oblique. It was just a memory. And he, he told it to, to a group of people. So I don't think, if, you know, I'm, I'm breaking any confidences. But he said he, he, he told me on his father that there was a wagon load of supplies, a horse-drawn wagon got up to the house. And the horse bolted. And the, the, the wagon was overturned and all the stuff was thrown on the ground and spoiled. And his father thought that Eugene had scared the horse because he'd been messing around with something earlier on. And, um, and he hit him. He said, that's the only time my father had hit me. He hit me hard, knocked me across the room. And then he burst into tears. And I thought that in some way that that was Eugene's world. And that was why he was telling it. Yeah. You know, obviously there's an encapsulation going on, going on there. Of, of Also the breeding of the bulls though is fascinating and the way it permeates the the work. Yeah, well, I mean, I was walking across the field with Eugene and Adam McCarrick and uh, and, uh, there was a kind of long plastic thing on the the ground and and he he said, that's that's what the AI man uses, the inseminator (laughs) for his arm. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, that that would have been, Eugene was was unsentimental about uh, about life and death, as, as, as farmers are, you know, because they, they, they see it. But an astonishing awareness of beauty and, and the naming of things. Have you ever noticed? He, you know, he, he will he will name parts of bogland. He will name the tr- if, if there's a tree, he will name what the tree is. Yeah. He, he, he was very alert to the natural world. 
yeah. Even the name Winters for the protagonist, you know, conjuring up this wintry persona. Um, there's another question from Dee Coldrick and the panel suggesting that we consider uh, Colin McCann's a paragon, which is also, of course, yeah. about I mean, yeah, covering that's... people. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the thing about McCann's writing generally, I suppose, is that, uh, and it's not, it's not necessarily terribly fashionable, uh, is that there's a real kind of utopian element, uh, kind of undertow to, I think, to McCann's writing. And in a Paragon, of course, you know, and he very often draws, I mean, you look at most of his work, he, he draws on real historical figures and and, 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 and translates them into, into narratives. And in a Paragon, you know, the, it's a legitimate example because it, it deals with the, the, the Israeli-Palestine conflict um about two people whose children have been killed by the, the opposing sides uh and, and the way in which that they they come to, well they they enter a kind of mutual counseling and, and they enter uh into into a kind of friendship um and you know that, that there, there is that there yeah i mean it's it's i suppose you know and that isn't the, the only place i suppose in in mccann's work of paragon is obvious because it deals with the the ongoing israeli palestine conflict um, and the ever shrinking borders there, or expanding borders, depending on what what, what way you're looking at it. Um, or, uh, but you know that that's there in in, in work like you know, Zoli uh, about the Romani poet who has to cross and migrate across Central Europe. Um, it's there in Dancer when he deals with Rudolf Nureyev and the exile out of Russia, and then his sexuality and, and all sorts of boundaries in in that novel as well. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think, yeah, I think McCann is, is, is very much, uh, not, not, not only in a paragon, but right across his work, he's interested in, in, in borders, in exile, in migration, in displacement. Yeah, you, 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 as you say, there's a utopianism in it, and uh, I mean, I think there's a, there, 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 there's a bleakness in, in Eugene's vision, um, which in many ways that the, is only sort of mediated by, by beauty, I mean, that, that, that really, I mean, I just when we were talking, there, I was thinking of the final lines of, of Death and Nightingale. Um, are you hurting? Are you sick, Beth? Unto death, Mr. Winters, unto death. You know, that, that, that there is, there's no way back from these wounds. Mm. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's um, and I, I, I mean, I, I think that the counterpoint all the way through Eugene's writing is he counterpoints that bleak uh, vision with, with, with beauty. Um, mm -hmm. with the beauty of the language and, and, and the, the beauty that he finds in, in, in landscape as well. Mm. Yeah. But it's, it's not, uh, he, Eugene, you know, was a very, very, he was a lovely, civil uh, man. And there was a darkness to him, you know, and I think the darkness was the way he saw the world, um, you know. Did you have to get to know him very well to see the darkness in the in the person as opposed to in the work? Well, I, I think because he, he was what they would refer to in the company as a gentleman. I mean, he, he was very much in every sense a gentleman and patrician with it, you know, as, 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 to a certain extent. Um, but uh, when he talked about writing, he talked very, very honestly and in a very revelatory manner. I mean, it, it was it was great for me as a young writer. He was the first proper writer I'd ever met, you know, and I'd ever spent time in and how how you fit yourself into the world as a writer. I can, can see that, you know, I've learned a lot of that from, from, from Eugene. Um, but yeah, uh, but it, he, he didn't hold anything back, you know, he, he, would, he would sort of relate things which a lot of other people would, would regard as kind of private, um, but he, he, would, he would tell you because I think he felt he'd been given this job, he'd never taken a workshop before, um, he didn't really know what the, 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 the boundaries of it should or should not be, so he took us on as a writer, and he took his job seriously, to, and and part of that that job was to reveal the dark places that that, that he that he drew his work from. And w do you feel that any of your own work is influenced by that? I think uh, yeah, we we, we kind of <laughs> I think sometimes arrive at the same places by different routes, but uh, that that counterpoint of of of, of beauty and, and and bleakness, um, I think, is something which. A place I find myself, uh, and I can very much relate to it in, in Eugene. The the darkness at the heart of it. You, well, it, 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 I suppose uh, you know, having grown up where I grew up, and then through while, while I grew up and, and seeing what I saw, um, that the uh, face in, in 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 people is is uh, you know kind of 
quite hard to find. It's, a, it's hard one. Faith in politics is very hard one. And the only thing that, for me, the, the, the saving thing is, is beauty. Um, it was and beauty does that the include the beauty of the human spirit, or is it? Yes, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, but you know, if if you know, I, I'm I'm sort of kind of struggling to find the kind of terminology of this again. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at talking about my own work, but um, I mean, if if there if there is if there is a god, if there is beauty, then there must be a god, or there must be be something of that. I mean. It's one of the things I liked about Eugene and I liked about uh, Cormac McCarthy as well. Mm. They use the, the word God often and, and with, without irony. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a gravely voiced and unforgiving God, if you like. <laughs> Old, Old Testament. Testament. Yeah. yeah, very much Old Testament, yeah. yeah. I mean, since you say that one, that when I just, it struck me ta- that when you were ta- speaking about the tales from the poor house, where you've got this whole scenario of, of you know, absolute cataclysmic suffering. Um, and each of the stories is told about, you know, betrayal, um, separation, murder, violence. But the orphan, there's something redemptive there about the orphan in that story, Roisin Brady. There's something, and it, whether it's beauty or it's hope, or it's something that, that he just seeds that whole collection, uh, you know, that, that's, as I said, is just an, an almost a cataclysmic, apocalyptic, you know, um, a series of events and years, but there, there, there's just something redemptive there. Her spirit, I suppose, her spirit to survive. Um, I, it just struck me when you were talking about it there that that that, that might be relevant to, to to thinking about Eugene's work. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and life goes on. You know, um, the children are born into you know, and the cycle of life goes on. He's very, very very aware of that, and that in itself is some kind of redemption. I, I, I would imagine. We have a, a comment from Diane McPhelan saying that she had the pleasure of working alongside Eugene McCabe and he was, as, as uh, Owen McNamee says, very much a gentleman. She says, I think he saw and felt the world deeply, especially the tragedies Ireland suffered, such as the famine. And thank you for such a lovely discussion. And the clock is against us, so we leave it there. That's a very nice comment to end on the idea of this perfect gentleman who felt the world deeply and expressed that in his work. Could I just remind you that we're talking about this book, Death and Nightingales. Get your hands on a copy. It's well worth reading. And this is the final Border Literatures of 2021, but we hope to see you back on the 19th of January at 7 p.m. for our next event on the young adult novel, Guard Your Heart by Sue Nib- Divin. That event will be moderated by Freya McClements and the panel will consist of Alison Garden and Dawn Sherrod Bado. So, Thank you to our panellists, Owen McNamee and Owen Flannery and the National Library of Ireland for organising the series and get reading. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Martina.